Dimensions of the real world. The theory that there's always enough money to pay the interest has a certain elegant simplicity. However, by the very nature of the assertion to be true, it has to be 100% true. This is impossible. For one thing, secondary lenders, who are not banks, do comprise a significant proportion of lenders, and they add their interest charges to money that already bears an interest burden. Beyond that, we have a cultural expectation. Everyone who has money expects it to generate more. Money that needs to be spent and made available to be earned by its original borrower is, instead, lent at interest or invested for gain. Therefore, we can conclude that the two conditions that must be true for all borrowers to be able to make their payments of principal plus interest and thus permanently discharge their debt, those conditions are not met by the current system. Nowhere in the current system is there any restriction on relending money that was created as a loan, nor is there any obligation upon banks to make their profits from interest available to be earned by borrowers, enabling them to extinguish their debts. Quite the opposite, banks invest these profits to make further profits. And it's not just the banks that cause the problem. Anyone who takes their ball of money and starts rolling it like a snowball to make it bigger does so at the expense of borrowers who will not find that money available to pay their debts except as more debt. And of course, those rolling the biggest snowballs pick up the most snow. As the saying goes, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Money needed by borrowers in the lower realms of workaday productive economics moves upstairs to play in the casino world of abstract financial profit, and that's a world where transactions are little more than gambling on numbers in an effort to achieve higher numbers. They have little or nothing to do with providing the necessities of life. Today, the largest volume of money by far is changing hands in what is best described as the gambling economy. The foreign exchange markets, the derivatives market, and the rest of the financial instruments being played by banks and investment funds for as much profit as possible. For example, the volume of trade on the world's foreign exchange markets in just one week exceeds the total volume of world trade in real goods and services during an entire year. This money is in continuous play by speculators looking to make windfall profits on currency fluctuations. It exists, but only in the gambling economy. So how unpayable is the ubiquitous interest burden in actual fact? That could only be determined with certainty by tracking all the money in the world. With over six billion people earning, spending, borrowing and lending, the world's money flows are at least as complex as the flows of the ocean. They are impossible to know. But the direction is pretty clear and simple. And it's the same old story. The rich are taking increasingly more money into the gambling economy, where ordinary borrowers have almost no chance to obtain it. And the only way the system can stay solvent is to create more money. And as money is created as debt, the only way to create more money is to create more debt in every way possible, including ridiculously easy credit for unqualified borrowers, massive government expenditures on security and war, and bailouts of insolvent banks. How does the individual loan cycle relate to the boom and bust phenomenon known as the business cycle? The individual loan cycle can be described like this. First, there is economic stimulation because of initial spending. This is followed by inflation because new money basically just dilutes the money supply. And eventually, inflation is followed by deflation as loan repayments gradually extinguish the principal, removing that money from circulation. As long as the individual loan cycles don't match up, these cycles can smooth each other out. 
This creates a fairly stable money supply that leads to fairly stable prices. Although continuous growth of the money supply is required, at least in part because as you will recall, the money to cover the interest was never created. This is the model on which our economy is currently based. Avoiding deflationary spirals and keeping inflation at a level that doesn't upset people's apple carts constitutes the art of managing the economy, which is rather narrowly defined as achieving so-called price stability. However, a look at the purchasing power of the U.S. dollar in real goods over the last century instantly reveals what this so-called price stability has really meant. The dollar has clearly lost almost all of its value, 96%, and is continuing to do so at a rapid pace. So price stability is not being achieved, and one hardly needs a degree in psychology to understand how human nature itself would turn the individual loan cycle into the collective phenomenon of the business cycle. The simple reason being that if one person sees great prospects and is doing well borrowing and expanding, others would have the confidence to do the same. Beyond the merely psychological effects, if one business is expanding on the basis of credit, its suppliers and distributors will find it necessary to do so as well, or lose that business to someone who will. The same hurt effect would occur for a gloomy outlook and accompanying credit contraction. Thus, it is entirely predictable that individual loan cycles would have a built-in propensity to line themselves up rather than be randomly distributed. And when they do, we see the larger scale cycle called the business cycle emerging directly from the cumulative effects of individual loan cycles. So, to sum up, one could say that out of the exchange of promises made by the bank and the borrower, society gets chronic inflation and a dependency on banks for increasing infusions of money to pay ultimately impossible interest payments. This results in an inescapable treadmill of accelerating debt and depreciating money, the only alternative being a deflationary collapse of the economy followed by social chaos or war. This eminently unhealthy situation filters down through society, wreaking harm on every level. We are like addicts, but the fix is not more and more heroin, it's more and more credit money. And eventually, our collective ability to borrow and repay so much credit becomes exhausted. This then creates the need for constant expansion of credit into new markets, in essence creating a fiscal imperative to drive everyone in the world further and further into debt forever. In the United States, this constant debt expansion has led to a total credit market debt in 2008 of more than $53 trillion, which is about five times the total annual income of the entire country. So is the world at large happy about its end of the loan transaction? Probably not. But the world at large has very little awareness of where these problems originate the elusive system of counterfeiting and hidden control that is modern banking. And how about the banks? How have the banks fared as a result of this system? Well first, by putting up only a small fraction of the money they ostensibly lend, the banks have obtained a river of income from interest payments on consumer loans and mortgages. Second, by using their credit powers to acquire large portfolios of corporate and government bonds, banks collectively appropriate control over government and industry. And thirdly, due to the inevitable defaults and foreclosures, control over government and industry. And thirdly, due to the inevitable defaults and foreclosures, the banks gain legal title to a lot of real property the world over. And finally, if the worst happens, if borrowers default en masse, causing the banks large losses, the government is forced to rescue the banks with multi-billion dollar bailouts to save the financial system. And what are these bailouts financed with? You guessed it, more taxpayer debt. It is really quite an achievement to pull this off, and without most of the victims even being aware of it.